get the impression that parables were just as numerous in Jesus' day as dad jokes in our day. The happy Father's Day to all our fathers out there. Here, uh, Jesus, he gives um, two parables comparing the kingdom of God as well as uh, this parable in the first reading, right? This parable uh, that Ezekiel gives us, God speaking through Ezekiel, and he's also talking about his kingdom. And that word kingdom in Greek is basileus, where it was used for, to, uh, you know, when describing like the Roman basileus and the Greek basileus, right? Not just a kingdom, like a nation with a king, but an empire where the emperor ruled over other kings. In other words, like Caesar would have been a king of kings. And so God talking about his kingdom, Jesus talking about his kingdom, he's talking about like an empire, right? He is king of kings. And when you think about those ancient empires and how they were built and constructed, we usually think in terms of these great monumental, like architectural, beautiful construction, like structures. I was just talking with a, a family uh, after the nine o'clock mass who's going to Rome, right? You think of the Colosseum and the Pantheon, right? These amazing ancient structures. And in a lot of ways, we can put ourselves back in those days and kind of put ourselves in the shoes of uh, the emperor and think like, this is the pride of his empire. But that's in such stark contrast to how Jesus describes the kingdoms in his parables and how God described the kingdom in the parable through Ezekiel. In both parables, he said the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. A seed. A seed that grows into a plant or a seed that mysteriously grows with a principle of growth that's within itself and not another. In other words, the one scattering the seed, he's not constructing the plant. But it's something that grows on its own. It's something organic, not organizational. It's something living, not a structure like the Pantheon. In other words, like Jesus has life in mind when he thinks about the grandeur of his kingdom, not about structures. He has life in mind. And in these parables, when we hear about seed, at the end of the day, it's, it's not about seed to have a plant one day we're talking about persons, not plants. And so if we're talking about the seed of persons, we're talking about fathers. We're talking about fatherhood. Right? The kingdom of heaven is necessarily paternal, all coming from God the Father, who by the seed of his word has eternally begotten his son, and by the seed of his word has begotten eternal life in every single one of us. First, having created us in his own image and likeness. And then recreating us in the image of his own son, beginning with baptism. When we are made a new creation. It is necessarily paternal because that's who God is. He is essentially a father. Now, in, in saying this, I think a lot of people hear this and think that this is a commentary on the relative worth of men and women. And that is not true. The worth of man and woman comes from 
the beginning of scripture when God creates them male and female in the image of God, he created them both. And that's where the equal dignity of man and woman comes from. That both are made in the image of God. Nevertheless, they are different. And because man, in a sense, bears the seed of life, he bears within him what makes somebody a father. That he carries within himself the potency to beget life. Just as woman carries within herself the fertility to conceive life within her. And it brings about this beautiful dynamic that images God more perfectly than they would as individuals. Because God is a communion of persons. That man and woman are called together and from them they generate life. So in saying that, I want you to hear that, women. You are not less than man. You are also created in the image of God. And that is where your worth comes from. Obviously, today is Father's Day, so I want to highlight the fathers. As all mothers and all fathers bear the image of God to their sons and daughters, and this is true of mothers, but in fathers also, that you bear an amazing dignity and an amazing responsibility to be God's proxies to your children in life. That is both awesome and terrifying. <laughs> There's a reason why the fourth commandment says, honor your mother and your father. And that word honor is literally glorify. And in all of scripture, the only other one who is to be glorified is God. And so that God would command children to glorify their mother and their father. I mean, what does that say about what God thinks about mothers and fathers? And so it's right that we have a day like today where we honor and glorify our fathers, our earthly fathers. And I think that word patriarchy has become such a dirty word in our language. But literally the word just means that this life, has, this family has or or originated from the father. Pater is the word for father. Arche means beginning. It began with the father. Patriarchy, that's, just, that's simply what that word means etymologically. And it's right that we acknowledge that without our fathers, we wouldn't exist. We owe our existence to our fathers, especially to God our father. Do you have any idea the probability that you exist. I should say the improbability of your existence. That your mother and your father had to meet at just the right time in a very short window of time in order for you to exist. But not only that, their parents had to do the same thing, a very short window of time. And their parents, and their parents before them, you go back, I don't know how many generations to our first parents. And if any one of them in that line of ancestry is off even by a few days, you don't exist. You have a better chance of winning the lottery thousands of times in a row than you do of existing. Do you realize that? We've won the jackpot. Like, this is more than winning the jackpot. But that's in terms of probability. But in the mind of our Father, 
God our Father? He's like, well, of course you exist. I wanted you. I have the awesome privilege as a priest looking out at all of you of getting a sense of like God's delight, your Father's delight when he sees you. I think we all know that God loves us, but I think we can kind of reduce that to a sort of stoic um, sense that God loves us, that he does good for us despite ourselves. But did you know that God likes you? He actually is interested in you. He's actually fascinated by you. And when he looks upon you, He delights in you. And I can tell you right now, I I feel some of the delight the Father is taking in you right now. It's a beautiful gift. And I hope and pray that you come to appreciate not just the gift of life that you've been given, but you have a Father who loves you. And when he sees the glory of his kingdom, He doesn't look at monumental structures. He thinks of you. You who have now been taken up into the glory of his eternal son. He looks upon you with the same ecstatic delight as he looks upon his son through all eternity. Because he sees you in his son. And his son is heaven to him. Our father loves you and he delights in you. And so now let us turn to him in the sacrifice of the mass when we offer him our praise and worship. For it is right that we glorify our father.